on the 6th of August, 1945, at 8.15 in the morning, for the first time in the history of mankind, an atomic bomb was dropped with the sole aim of killing as many people as possible with one single massive blast. In Hiroshima, 70,000 people died instantly and 70,000 more were severely injured. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki and that started the end of World War II. Now, these two bombs, they were developed in the Manhattan Project, which started in 1942, and at the peak of its activity employed more than 130,000 people in 30 different sites across the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. So in the West, people were frantically trying to develop a nuclear bomb to exert power over the enemy and win the war. The race was on. And in the East, following Pearl Harbor in 1941, in the East, the Allied forces started an offensive in the South Pacific in August 1942 when they invaded the island of Guadalcanal, part of the Solomon Islands. And there they did not reckon with one major important enemy. Because in the heat of the night, after the machine guns went silent, the sound of a far bigger enemy remained. The sound of the mosquito. Malaria had a huge impact on the morale of these soldiers. They were sick most of the time. And in the South Pacific alone, more than 100,000 men, troops, were suffering from malaria, losing in total five million days in the front lines where they could not fight. They were not fit to fight. So the impact of the disease was absolutely massive. And sure, sure, there were drugs. Drugs were available, but quinine, which was produced on the island of Java, was not accessible to the Allied forces because the Japanese had invaded Java in March 42, just a few months earlier. So the Allied forces were cut off from quinine. They had an alternative, a synthetic drug called atabrine, but atabrine had two major issues with it. The first issue was that if you take the drug, it had a bad side effect. It made your skin turn yellow. And the troops simply refused to take a drug that would make their skin turn the same color as that of the enemy. The second reason is that there were very persistent rumors amongst the troops that if you would take atabrine, that it would cause impotency. So the troops simply refused to take their drugs no matter what was tried. And as a result, progress to end the war in the Pacific and defeat Japan was tremendously slowed down. There was no rapid progress. And it was simply because of this small little enemy here in my pocket, the mosquito. And I ask myself the question, if malaria would not have stopped these forces from moving towards Japan, would Japan have surrendered before the Manhattan Project was complete and the two bombs were ready to be dropped? In other words, would the bombs have fallen if it were not for the mosquito? So mosquitoes have had a huge impact throughout history on a lot of things that we've done. Major warlords have died as a result of malaria. Think about Genghis Khan, he died of malaria. Think about Alexander the Great, he died of malaria. Even boy king Tutankhamun, we know that he not only suffered from a bone fracture, but he was actually also infected with Africa's most deadly parasite, the Plasmodium falciparum. And that DNA of that parasite was found in his mummified tissues in 2010. So he also suffered from malaria. Malaria has actually had an impact on religion, believe it or not. On the 15th of September, 1590, Pope Urban VII was elected in Vatican City. And that was going to be the shortest papacy in history. His being the Pope lasted for only 12 days before he died of malaria, before he died of a single mosquito bite. The impact was huge. 
And even today, the famous and the rich still sometimes suffer from malaria. So for the ladies in the audience, I brought with you George Clooney, who in 2011 suffered from a severe bout of malaria when he was in Sudan as an observer for the elections. And for the men in the audience, I brought Cheryl Cole, who in 2010 went on a safari in Tanzania, contracted severe malaria, and almost died of it. And that was headline news. I feel well at all, and definitely from a Are you ill? Cheryl Cole has collapsed. Cheryl Cole has collapsed. Cheryl Cole collapsed during a photo shoot, and that was headlines. And after that, I wrote a blog, and the blog was titled, Thank You, Cheryl. And why was that? It's because the day after she contracted malaria, there were 52,000 websites around the world talking about malaria. Now, what more do you want as a malariologist than to have something like that happening? 52,000 websites talking about malaria. So why is this still important? It's important because even last year, we were looking at more than 400,000 deaths due to malaria around the world. We were looking at more than 200 million people going down with malaria last year. But mind you, we've made massive progress compared to the situation that we had at the turn of the millennium. Because at the turn of the millennium, we were still looking at 1.5 to 2.7 million deaths each year. And the total number of cases was anywhere between 300 million and half a billion cases. It's massive. So we've done a lot of good. Things have progressed extremely well. And what has progressed extremely well, I want to show you on a map. This is a map of Africa in the year 2000. And you see here the percentage of children between the age of 2 and 10 infected with malaria. So red, orange is really high. Dark blue is really low. That was the situation in the year 2000. And then we started doing something really well. First of all, we distributed bed nets. Bed nets impregnated with an insecticide that kill mosquitoes when they land on it and even repel them. A billion of these nets were distributed across the continent. Had a massive impact. Protect people from being bitten. Secondly, we went into houses and we started spraying houses with insecticide on the wall. We sprayed various kinds of insecticides, and these insecticides would kill mosquitoes when they would land on the walls after taking blood. And third, the third thing we did, we did really well is that we had a very potent drug. The artemisinin-based combination therapies have saved lots of life. Over the last 15 years, some 700 million cases were averted and 6.2 million lives were saved. And therefore, I'm happy to show you the map, the way it looked in 2015. See how it changed. This is the map in 2015. The red and orange colors are almost gone. We went massively forward. And that's great news. So, I'm showing you the same thing here on the graph. The black line is no change if we would have done nothing. But we intervened with the nets, the sprays, and the drugs. And therefore, we got the red line. And now there's optimism. Maybe we can eliminate this disease from the face of the planet. So the World Health Organization is making plans that by 2030, we're going way down. And the Gates Foundation is even talking about 2040, gone. No more malaria in the world. So it looks a bit like this. That's what we want. So how do we get there? Because at the same time that I'm showing you these tools, we're also facing problems. Problems with drug resistance, problems with insecticide resistance, they don't work that well anymore. So people are frantically trying to develop new tools. What else can we get in the toolbox to control the disease? And so we're looking at modern biotechnology, developing a vaccine, developing genetically engineered mosquitoes, nifty science, biotechnology. And sure, that may help us one day, but active listening to the past of malaria is what I want to do. And therefore, I'm taking you back 87 years to an historical event that, in my view, changed the world completely in the way we control malaria. The year is 1930, and there's a French marine ship in the harbor in Dakar, Senegal, in West Africa. And in that harbor are African malaria mosquitoes, and they fly onto the ship, and they take blood from the soldiers on that ship, 
and they stay there. The ship leaves the harbor and in five days goes across the Atlantic Ocean to Natal. In that period, these mosquitoes on board have now turned their blood into eggs and are ready to lay these eggs in water. So when they arrive in Natal, they fly off the ship, they find a pool of water and they lay the eggs. We had an invasion of an African malaria mosquito in Brazil. And the mosquito was doing extremely well. As a matter of fact, the, the, climate, the climate and the habitat in Brazil was pretty much the same as you see in Senegal. On the left here, you see two pictures of Brazil. On the right, you see the two pictures of Senegal. Pretty much the same thing. Climate the same, so these mosquitoes were doing extremely well. And that went on for about eight years. And in these eight years, those mosquitoes, they, they distributed themselves over an area the size of 54,000 square kilometers. Shown here. 54,000 square kilometers. And then a massive epidemic broke out. 200,000 people got infected with malaria. Thousands were perishing, were dying of the infection. And people realized, if we don't stop this now, that malaria in South America is going to be as bad as malaria in Africa. So we have to stop this now. And in came a person, an American, an epidemiologist, with the name Fred Soper. Soper came in and thought of a strategy not to cure people, but thought of a strategy to get rid of the very last mosquito. And the way he did that is by training. By training lots of young Brazilians to go out and find this water where these mosquitoes were breeding. And basically the way they instructed him is that if you go out, you have a bag with insecticide and every water that you find, you start treating it with that insecticide. You find all the standing water in the area that you're working in and you treat it with insecticide. 4,000 Brazilian youngsters came enrolled in this campaign. And you know what? After 18 months, the show was over. Soper had eliminated that invasion to the very last mosquito, over 54,000 square kilometers. That's an incredible accomplishment. So, how did he do this? These guys went out on mules and donkeys. He was drawing his maps by hand. And they were using an insecticide that is very toxic. And the world has changed. I mean, look at where we are now. We have massively improved transport and infrastructure. We have satellite images. And we have biological control tools, alternatives that are not as toxic as the stuff they used a long time ago. Put on top of that all of the new technology that we have. As I said, satellite imagery, geographical information systems, mobile phones, computers. If SOPA would be alive today, he would kick our butts in the field. And he would say, go out and do it. And do it better than we did it back then. And that's a thought I can't let go of. Because it's so powerful. By looking at the past, taking the tools that we used then and applying them again today. And so I was playing around with the idea. Suppose we would take exactly the same campaign that Sopa ran in Brazil and copy it. We copy it to Africa. We do exactly the same thing as he did. And over that area, these 54,000 square kilometers, there's eight countries in Africa today that are about the size of 54,000 square kilometers or even smaller. Within 18 months, they could get rid of their malaria. But suppose because of all of this technology and these advances that we have, improved infrastructure, roads, everything else, that we would be bold. We would be doing this better than SOPA did. We would double the campaign. And if we would double the campaign, suddenly Eritrea and Malawi would come into play. Or become even more bold and say, we're going to do this five times the size of what SOPA did. And you see, almost the whole of West Africa could now be freed of malaria. And if we get really bold, and we do it ten times better than SOPA did, we may actually be moving towards a continent without the disease. 
So the question is, how do you do this? And in order to run a campaign like that, you need people, lots of people, to go around and treat breeding sites. You need thousands of people. Now, where do I get these people from? And I would say it's dead simple. If you look at unemployment rates in Africa, in the age cohort between 15 and 24 years old, there is massive unemployment. Here is your army that can run your public health campaigns. They can get rid of the disease themselves. So if we are running towards 2040 and our goal is to eliminate this disease from the face of the planet, we have to start staging some very serious campaigns. We can't let go. It has to be thorough. It has to be rigorous. And otherwise, we will fail. And I want to end with the words of the man himself, of Fred Soper himself, who said, there is no such thing as partial success. It is going to be either glorious success or dismal failure. Thank you.